guilty plea. That's the nothing personal word of the day. It is Thursday, April 11th, 2024. And I'm referring to the guilty plea, the bombshell story that dropped late last night that Shohei Otani's interpreter is in talks with the authorities to actually plead guilty to federal crimes in connection with the theft of Otani's money. Let's bring you back to the quick fact pattern. Interpreter, Japanese baseball player, very famous, pitches, hits, signs big contract, goes to Korea, opens the season. Everyone's excited. All of a sudden, the interpreter out of nowhere is fired. We don't know anything. Rumors, investigations, IRS, FBI, stolen money, change of story, Otani bet, Otani didn't bet, Otani knew, Otani didn't know. MLB, we don't need to investigate. MLB, we're investigating. Interpreter, no comment. Otani's agent, nowhere to be found cashing 5% of 700 million over 20 years. Story tourniqueted, nothing. And only three weeks later, a miracle has happened for Major League Baseball. The prayers have come true. It looks as though, according to the New York Times and TMZ, two amazing places to source, that Ipe Mizuhara is going to say that he did it, that Otani had nothing to do with it, and that even more importantly and shockingly, there is evidence that Ipe Mizuhara was able to change the settings on Otani's bank account so Otani didn't get those pesky alerts and those terrible confirmations that no one wants to get about any transactions. Of course, we don't quite have the details about how money comes out of an account. We're not talking like the guy in Jacksonville who's going to go to prison, who stole 22 million, like five bucks at a time, 20 grand at a time, you know, rounding errors that just sort of disappear. I don't know if they're rounding errors in everybody's life. They're not. But when you're running a big company, you've heard about people. Don't get greedy. Let's stick to our skimming of 10 bucks. It adds up. I'd say, trust me, but that infers that I've done that. Of course, I have not. But the wires to the bookie, which we have to talk about, that's the settings that were changed that, hey, wiring can come out of maybe it was the mobile app, $500,000 wires, several of them that may have been for even more than four and a half million. That's a hell of a setting. Here's what I found out yesterday, Pablo. I found out that on my bank app, and I really, really tried, I couldn't find the settings to change that would stop any alerts and phone calls that come to me because try I did. I've told you the story of the alerts and transactions that require my absolute approval that are in the $100 range, forget $500,000 range. And so the narrative is now totally what baseball needs it to be. We have a lone gunman with a single bullet, game over. We don't need to punish. We don't need to discipline. We don't need to ruffle the feather of the face of our franchise. We don't need to ruffle the feather of the face of our league. And we can go on and just say to him, sorry, dude, next time, trust your interpreter less. Sorry, next time, have one of your agents or financial advisors actually pay attention to anything related to your life instead of just taking salaries and commissions from what you do. Sorry, I wish Korea had gone smoother for you, but let bygones be bygones. If you can sense the frustration in my voice, it's this. 
I have no proof. I'm not investigating this. I'm not an investigative journalist. I'm looking at this from my lens as a former executive, as a lawyer, somebody, as someone who understands how leads work. I can't make sense of it. And for me, the way I finish dealing with an issue is when my mental Rolodex stops. And if you're not watching on Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel, I, I, and you're listening to this, thank you, but the visual is, it may look like what I'm doing is saying, oh, I'm crazy. That used to be when you're a kid, you look at another kid, oh, you're crazy as you twirl your finger around your ear. That to me is my brain. And there's an old thing called the Rolodex where you put business cards on and it's this big wheel that you turn and you keep turning the wheel to get to where you're supposed to get to, the person you're looking for. That's how my brain operates. And my Rolodex is always spinning until it comes to the a stop and the stop means that I can make sense of the world around me. It doesn't make sense. It was explained to me by a banker. Hey, maybe it's a bank that's going to get in trouble because they don't have the bona fides of cybersecurity and protection that let's say a JP Morgan has or a Bank of America has. Maybe Shohei Otani was in some crappy local bank and not all local banks are crappy. Don't get me wrong where they did not have any of these checks and balances in place. The Rolodex keeps going because that doesn't explain where his advisors and agents were. David, someone else said to me, you know, he relied on the interpreter to do everything. You can't blame him. He doesn't speak much English. So the interpreter, forget best friends, they were truly business partners. And sometimes you can't control if your business partner steals from you. No, nope, Rolodex didn't stop there either. Because again, it's not one layer of protection that these players have. What's the lesson to be learned here? If you're going to have money stolen from you, be the face of a league and then it'll all go away and you'll make it better. I don't think that's the lesson. Do we think this would have been differently? Do you think... MLB would have done dirty if it were some random roster guy, somebody from either the US or the Dominican, let's say, or Venezuela, where money gets disappeared all the time. Kidnappings happen all the time. No, I think I got the lesson. I think the union needs to make sure with all of its players, whether they're Asian born or international born, where English is a second language. English is a third language. I think there should be a rule in place that there has to be an overseer from the union who is just a check and balance person who makes sure the agents are doing right by their players. I know that sounds amazing. Make sure the agents are doing right and make sure the players are being properly taken care of. Is there still room where fraud can happen? Fraud is a little like life in Jurassic Park. It finds a way. But the goal is to make it more difficult. And nothing could be less difficult than blaming the interpreter, saying it was him and he switched. Let me get it right one final time before I move on. He switched alerts and confirmations and settings and notifications. Yippee Kaye. It's really hard to relocate a team. And I know that we have talked about that, but we get to talk about it again because all of the hockey fans out there, and there are many of you, I don't talk hockey enough on the show. And now that Sarah's a part of the show and she's such a big hockey person, I feel as though I have to add more hockey into the nothing personal repertoire. And that means that Sarah should feel free to give me some suggested stories. That would be good that we can talk about and argue over the way I do with Coca. I don't know what you all think about the Coyotes, but I know what I thought about them almost a year ago when I told you in a wait to see, it was almost a year ago, like mid-May, where I promised you that the Coyotes were going to move. I'm not taking the win for that yet, but I'm getting ready. I'm getting my best suit on getting my tie and getting ready to accept flowers 
call back to Atlanta. Flowers. Because rumor is that the Coyotes are moving to Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City. It's hard not for me to think of Josh Gad and Book of Mormon when I think of Salt Lake City. It's hard for me to not think of Stockton to Malone when I think of Salt Lake City. It's hard for me to not think of Park City when I think of Salt Lake City. There is one thing that I never associated with Salt Lake City, and that would be two professional sports teams. It was always the Utah Jazz. Back in the day of the Miller family. Well, there's a new sheriff in town, and his name is Ryan Smith. And Ryan Smith has something called Smith Entertainment Group. And Ryan Smith is saying to himself, I want this to be a big league city. And guess what? They're about to get a hockey team because the people in Phoenix have been doing nothing but trying to get rid of their hockey team. There have been ballots. There have been votes. There have been negotiations. The Coyotes have been playing in front of a capacity 4,300 people for over a season now. An absolute embarrassment. Can you imagine a major, major league team, major professional team playing in a minor league facility for a sustained period of time? Who would ever do that? Basketball wouldn't play in a high school gym. Baseball wouldn't play in a minor league facility. Oh, hold on. Coca, let's do that again. Four, eight, six, nine. Basketball wouldn't play in a high school gym. Baseball would play in a minor league stadium. I can't say they wouldn't. They just agreed to play in Sacramento. It's a total minor league stadium. So I guess it's totally fine that the Coyotes were playing in a college arena. No, it's not fine. The Coyotes are on their last leg. They're doing some cockamamie plan right now outside of Scottsdale. And here's the plan. It's quite easy. We're going to buy some land at auction and build an entire development on that land. In my experience, the only auctions that you're guaranteed to win are the ones that are fixed. Baseball knows a thing about fixing auctions. If you know, you know. Dodgers, Red Sox, fixed. I digress. The auction in Phoenix, not fixed, therefore unclear. But here's the best part. I'm not sure the owner of the Coyotes even wants to win the auction other than to develop land. Here's why. The NHL is going to purchase the Phoenix Coyotes from Alex Morello, who has been a not perfect owner. Who of us has been? Not an us. I'm a president. Who of them has been? You remember when he bought that team, they were bankrupt from their last owner. You remember the league operated the Coyotes the way the league operated the Expos? They operated them for four years and then sold the team to Alex. Now Alex is going to parlay that into a bill. You may be wondering, is that team worth a billion dollars? And the answer is no. But guess what? Owners accomplish several things. One, in hockey, you now have a the Ottawa Senators on record at a price close to a billion. You've got the Phoenix Coyotes on record at a billion. All other franchise values increase, which makes owners happy. Then you don't reward the current Phoenix Coyotes owner by allowing him to relocate. Instead, you buy the team for yourself. This is right out of the playbook that we did in 2002. You have the league on the franchise, so the league profits from the sale of that franchise. The league bought the Expos from Jeffrey Loria for $120 million and sold it for over $400 million back in 2002. That money got distributed to all 30 owners. So Jeffrey is one of the 30 owners because he was now in Florida, did get some of his own money back at one point. But I digress. All of that profit, instead of going to Alex, it goes to every owner, which begs the question, why would Smith in Park City, in Salt Lake City, agree to pay $1.3 million? 
And what's interesting is that it is cheaper for him to buy an existing franchise than it is to get an expansion franchise. And the expansion fees are not pennies. Only three years ago, the Seattle Kraken expansion fee was 650 large. So we know that that's going up. Let's say we're up to 900 million. Let's say we're up to a billion. So you're paying a billion and then you've got to put an infrastructure in place and you've got to do a draft and wait a couple of years and then play. When you get a relocated team, you relocate the players and you start playing next year. And all of this has come out because the NHL has a preliminary schedule for next year, which has a team in Salt Lake City. Hard to hide from schedules, which is why MLB had to deal with the A's Sacramento situation so early. You've got to get a preliminary schedule. The Inside the league, they're already on to next year. Very bizarre. Playoffs haven't even started. You're thinking about next year. We're going to find out what happens here. But I do have a certain thought. Is that when you are the commissioner of hockey, you're trying to take one fire at a time. You Like a parent who has a kid who's really well behaved and then kids who are not, the kids who are not behaved take up all your time. Or when you're in school, when you want to be the class jester or the center of attention, you're the one who gets disciplined and the smart guy in the corner gets no love or attention and can't maximize his or her potential. In sports, it's the same. The commissioner spends the most time on the teams with the most problems. Believe me, Rob Manfred is sick of the Oakland A's. Believe me. And Gary Bettman is sick of the Arizona Coyotes. I think what Gary Bettman would like to do is go back to focusing on maybe the Winnipeg Jets. The Winnipeg Jets are a team that we don't talk about really only when there's a major problem. They've got an owner, Mark Chipman, and he had a pretty good quote because they're having some attendance issues. They're having some revenue issues. And he had a good quote. He said, I wouldn't be honest with you. I hate when statements start with that. To be honest, da, 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 I wouldn't be honest with you if I didn't say that so many negatives. We've got to get back to 13,000 talking about season tickets. This place we find ourselves in right now, it's not going to work over the long haul. It just isn't. Step one of the things aren't going well, we got to get ready to relocate, is when you tell your market, hey, we have to set an unreasonable expectation. 13,000 season tickets. There's about 15 teams in baseball, I bet, who don't have 13,000 season tickets. And there's probably about 10 to 15 teams in hockey that don't. And that's purely, purely speculative. I'm sure one of you can go get a list of the amount of season tickets that each team has. And I'm telling you, 13,000 is a large amount. But when you make 13,000 your goal, what you're really saying is, we're setting you up to fail. So Gary Bettman wants to get this team to Salt Lake City as quickly as possible. Because then they can start worrying about Winnipeg. That's all you do. It's like whack-a-mole. That's what leagues do. I want to talk about something that happened yesterday that I got wrong. And before we go to break, I just wanted to bring it up and make sure that I'm more clear about it. Because it's obviously getting <clears throat> a whole lot of attention. So this is both a correction and a clarification. Yesterday, we talked about what the last dive bar did with the Oakland A's and with the Las Vegas Athletics, where they tried to get a trademark to Las Vegas Athletics. And in theory, they had filed their trademark and the team and the league had not. And I was critical of the team and league for not paying attention and for focusing on the Sacramento Athletics. And I used it to continue a narrative of, hey, I don't view this Vegas thing as definitely happening. Well, I still don't view the Vegas thing as definitely happening, but we are a live show and I make mistakes and I need to clarify something. MLB did something extremely tricky, extremely underhanded, but extremely legal and extremely dispositive. MLB and the A's did file 
for a, the trademark Las Vegas Athletics in a little Indian Ocean Island nation called Mauritius. Here's the weird thing about trademark law. When you file for a trademark in Mauritius on pick a day on May 1st, two things happen. You're filing to use that trademark only in Mauritius. But if Mauritius is a party to an international convention, which they are, you can then file that same trademark in any other country that's a part of that same convention. And you can backdate it by up to six months. And the backdated day becomes the earliest moment of that filing in that country. So here's the math. You go to Mauritius, and if anybody, any lawyer, is doing a search for you who you hire, say, hey, I want to trademark horse hockey. I can do a quick search of databases to see if there's another horse hockey trademark, if there's something pending. But there's certain places where the trademark may exist that I wouldn't be able to easily search. Mauritius is one of those places. So my lawyer would likely not search the Mauritius database. So I would proceed as though, hey, I've got horse hockey in the bag. Until someone would point out someone did horse hockey in Mauritius and I would say, uh-oh, what's the date? And they would say it's six months prior to the date they actually filed. And now they have filed in the United States because that's the craziness of the law is you're allowed to file in any other country because just filing in Mauritius, you don't have any rights in the US. But you've got a head start because then you can file in the US and you get to use that back date that you had when you filed in Mauritius. So a round of applause. MLB lawyers, trademark lawyers, the Oakland A's, you nailed it. Now, were you hiding stuff? Yeah. Were you doing it in a way so that no one would discover it? Yes, you were. Was it effective? Yes, it was. Does it take away from what Last Dive Bar and others are doing because of their upset with the Oakland situation? No, it doesn't. Thank you for allowing me to correct and clarify the story from yesterday. Okay, I think now we're going to go to break, Coca. When we come back, it's Thursday. We get to review one of my top 100 movies. And then we're going to talk about Adam Silver and the NBA and quite a few things that he covered after a Board of Governors meeting that are going to interest you. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal with David Sampson. We're here live Monday to Friday at 8 a.m. You may have been with me in Boston last night. If not, you can see that show. We'll drop it sometime this weekend. It is now off to Nashville, where I will have a live Nothing Personal show on Monday, April 15th, and then Pittsburgh, April 18th, all before the tour ends in New York City on April 29th, as in between, I try to run a marathon in under 10 hours in London. We got this, Coca. We got this. And we don't miss doing shows with you in the morning, even though Coca's as tired as I am. All right, let's talk about our movie. I'm still managing to watch a movie every day, which is, it really is a good thing I don't sleep much. Valley Girl. Can you put the poster up there on the screen if you have it? A Valley Girl, my number 88 movie with Nicolas Cage and Deborah Foreman. So a little nugget about that poster, if you look really closely at it, and I don't know how much you can zoom in, but the poster has the wrong actress on it. It's the most awesome story of Valley Girl. Other than that chick, Julie, she's truly dazzling. There's so many great lines from the Valley. It's about a girl from the Valley and a guy from Hollywood who's a sort of punker and how they end up falling in love. And what you may know is that I love romantic comedies. I love when there are connections made with unlikely people. And I love when it works out in the end. 
because in my mind, they're still together, even though the movie ends at the end of the high school prom. This movie has everything. The soundtrack is first class. The story is amazing. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Now look at the movie poster. Guess what? That's not Deborah Foreman. Deborah Foreman plays Julie in the movie, but when they made the poster, she had not yet been cast and they never changed the poster. It's a little known fact there, Normie. If you've never seen Valley Girl, there is a new Valley Girl that has one of the Paul brothers, Coca. I can't remember which one. I think it may not be the one fighting Tyson who plays sort of the buttoned up boyfriend from the Valley who loses the head cheerleader to this crazy punk from Hollywood. I think it was Logan Paul. That Valley Girl, hard pass. The original Valley Girl, go to it. Number 88 on my top 100. It always will be because I melt with you. All right, let's see what we're reviewing next Thursday. We have a document that was generated by one of our loyal listeners. And all Coca does is press a button and here he goes. Press it. Hey, number 34. We're reviewing the Oscar winner from last year. Everything, everywhere, all at once. For those of you who have not seen E-E-A-A-O, I would encourage you to see it before next week. I'm going to watch it again. The first time I watched it, I thought it was fine. The second time I watched it, really, really liked it. Have not watched it a third time. Get to watch Jamie Lee Curtis and Michelle Yao. Excited. We'll review that next week. Thank you, Coca. Okay. Let's talk about Adam Silver. You got to really love being commissioner. Pays good. The perks are outstanding. Get a lot of good friends in a lot of high places. You get to hang out. Your name gets rumored to be doing all sorts of fun things. You get to be in charge of a sport you love, even if people think you don't. There are some downsides. People without money think that there's no downside for people with money. People without powerful jobs think there's no downside for people with powerful jobs. It's funny. I think all people have very similar issues. You'd be shocked the problems that Adam Silver has as commissioner of basketball. The weight and people say, oh, give me a break. He did it to himself. Eh, when you've got the weight of a sport on your shoulders, it's tiring. Have you ever looked at a picture of a president of the United States day one and then at the end of four years? Go on the inter-Google and take a look at the way presidents age. Yes, they're the most powerful person in the world. The question is, is it worth it? Yeah, you get Secret Service the rest of your life, but is it worth it? If you take it seriously, and it's not just about power, and it's not just about ego, you have got a country to worry about. Everybody in the country, that's the ideal president. The ideal commissioner has to worry about not just his owners, but the teams, the game, the fans. And then you have to have board meetings, which are bump four, eight, 69. And then you have to have board meetings with a bunch of men who decide whether or not you're going to keep your job, decide what they're going to pay you, and you've got to basically give in to them while being the one who disciplines them. Have you ever figured and thought about how weird it is for Adam Silver to discipline Mark Cuban when Mark Cuban, not anymore, he's done in, with the Mavericks, where Mark Cuban would be fined by Adam Silver, but yet Mark Cuban could start a a coup against Adam Silver and have him removed? You don't think that ever factors into how commissioners think about things? Believe me, it does. Adam Silver addressed several issues yesterday. The first one that I want to talk about has to do with an owner who he is very loyal to. His name is Glenn Taylor. Glenn Taylor is the owner of the Timberwolves. There is a major problem going on between Glenn Taylor and A-Rod, and you're aware of it because 
go back and listen to one of our prior shows. A couple of things came out about the Timberwolves yesterday. The most important one was a rumor that A-Rod was going to cut payroll and that Glenn Taylor was upset that A-Rod was going to cut payroll and that that could be a reason why Glenn Taylor wanted to cancel the transaction to sell to A-Rod. It's total horse hockey. When I was selling the Marlins, I knew exactly what Jeter and Bruce Sherman were going to do with the team because I saw the financials. I knew exactly what was going to happen, and I still went forward with the transaction knowing they were going to have to make the trades because my job was to get the most money for our owner. That was it. Did it make me happy that they were going to trade Stanton, Yelich, and Ozuna, and JT Realmuto? No. But was I aware of it? Yes. When I go to contract with somebody, there are conditions precedent to a contract becoming effective. A condition in a deal can be, hey, don't move the team out of Milwaukee. Hey, I still get a owner's suite plus four season tickets for the next 20 years. Hey, I'm maintaining 5% limited partnership share, but I won't ever go in the clubhouse again. You can have all sorts of different things in a transaction. Here's what would never be in a asset purchase agreement between a seller of an NBA team and a buyer of an NBA team. Hey, you got to keep your payroll where it is. Hey, you've got to stay above the luxury tax. It's ridiculous. Because when A-Rod and Mark Laurie are going out to investors, when they're going out to banks, they have to show a business plan that is financially prudent. They have to show the way Bruce Sherman did and Derek Jeter when they were getting investors for the Marlins and when they were borrowing money. They had to show a business plan that was different than our business plan, which was to lose money every year. Idiocy. But that's what we did. Glenn Taylor, at his payroll, is willing to lose money. He's willing to pay into the luxury tax, but he doesn't go out to syndicates to borrow money. When a new buyer comes in, they've got to go to the bank, they've got to go to new investors, and they've got to show a company that actually is profitable, that won't require cash calls. Hi, I'd like to invest $100 million in the Timberwolves with you, Alex. I just have a quick question, if you don't mind, Mr. A-Rod. 12 months from now, will you be asking me for more money to maintain my 5% share? Funny you should ask, young gentleman. I'm going to take the $100 million from you. But then in a year, we will have lost so much money during the course of operation. I'm going to need another $10 million from you. And if you don't give it to me, you're going to get diluted. And if you do give it to me, that would be super nice of you because then we can keep all of our players. The investor would look at A-Rod and say, smell you later. I'm not going to invest in this team. I'm not going to invest in a team that loses money operationally that will require further further capital calls. It's absurd. A-Rod said, let me get back to you. And then he knocks on the door. Hi, my name is A-Rod. I've got a new set of projections. Take a look at what we did to payroll. Lowered it. Guess what? No capital calls next year. Hip, hip, hooray. Investor, sounds great to me. A-Rod, me too. Glenn Taylor, we've got your money. Glenn Taylor, hmm, I don't want to sell to you anymore because you're going to cut payroll. <clears throat> Not true. You may read about that, and you're going to read what a big deal it was that A-Rod was going to cut payroll and that Glenn Taylor was disappointed, especially because he was going to maintain a 20% share and his team is finally trying to be first in the Western Conference. Glenn Taylor and his lawyers are very clear about one thing. If there's a purchase agreement that is going to be found to be true and real and enforceable, the fact that A-Rod was going to lower payroll doesn't have any legal importance. None whatsoever. So then the question was asked, hey, you know, what are you doing? 
about the T Wolves situation. I think Adam Silver said, "Who me? I I don't think there's an issue here." And he had a great quote. He said, "It's not clear whether there will be a role for the league to get involved." Where it stands is Glenn Taylor on one hand as the seller of the franchise, and then with Mark Laurie and A-Rod as the buyers. They have a purchase agreement, and there's a dispute now in the purchase agreement. And in their purchase agreement, they have pre-agreed to arbitration. There's no role for the league in that process. That is a wonderful quote, and I want to explain it. What Adam Silver is saying is, hey, this is very simple. We have a buyer and a seller. And the league only approves buyers. And we only approve buyers that are brought to us by a seller. And sellers only bring us buyers when there's an agreement between the buyer and the seller where they have total agreement. Then we vote and then they can sign and execute the agreement and then it's enforced and done. There are myriad times when baseball teams or basketball teams are sort of futzing around with potential buyers. Hey, would you buy this team? What what would you pay for it? A couple bill? All right, let's let's start. Th- I'll, I'll talk about getting to agreement with you. And you start negotiating a couple things. Baseball is not involved other than to vet and at a very cursory level whether or not that potential buyer has a chance to pass through ownership criteria. But the league only gets it when there is a deal. And right now, that's the point in Minnesota. There's a fight over whether there's a deal. Adam Silver then had a talk about <clears throat> Jean Tay Porter. We have a wait to see about Jean Tay Porter. If you don't remember, he's the one who had the prop bets that were very strange, where all of a sudden he got sick and hurt and all of his unders hit. And it was the most bet things on the betting sites, which is quite bizarre. And then he was away for personal reasons. Well, guess what? Adam Silver addressed it and he said some things that may be little kernels toward where his head is. When asked about what John Tay Porter was accused of, he wanted to make sure that everyone was clear that he has the ability under the CBA to do whatever in the heck he wants to Porter. He said it's a cardinal sin what he's accused of in the NBA. And the ultimate extreme option I have is to ban him from the game. But then instead of talking about the case, he wanted to reiterate the power. That's the level of authority I have here. Because there's nothing more serious, I think, around this league when it comes to gambling, betting on our games. And this is direct player involvement. And so the investigation is ongoing, but the consequences could be very severe. I have a wait to see that he's going to be suspended for 10 minutes, 10, 10 minutes. Start again, Coca. I have a pending wait to see that he's going to be suspended for 10 games. I must tell you that I'm not feeling really good about that wait to see because it looks like that Adam Silver is setting us up for him to be banned for life because it seems like there's going to be direct evidence that John Tay Porter, contrary to what his brother Michael said, that there's going to be direct evidence that he bet on games himself and may have even bet against himself in a game he played in. And if that turns out to be true, Adam told you it's a cardinal sin. I'll tell you it's a lifetime banishment and there's no coming back. There's no reapplying after a year when you've bet against yourself in an NBA game. I'm still, however, going to hold out hope that it's not true because it makes it really, really bad for the league, really bad for all sports. The narrative that we'd have to talk about all over that you'd all be talking about is, my God, we've lost the integrity. Of course, our defense mechanisms will kick in and we'll say, oh, it's just, it's a lone guy, one guy, one example. Don't be ridiculous. It's not a big issue. Sound familiar? Nothing personal pick of the day. 
presented by DraftKings Fantasy Sports. Check out what DraftKings has to offer this season with code SAMSON, because life's more fun when you're in on the action. DraftKings, the crown is yours. We are starting a long climb back to respectability. You can't win two in a row before you win your first. Last night, I hope you were all with me, even though fading me recently has become a thing. You don't fade when Patrick Corbin is pitching. We had Hicks and the Giants over Corbin and the Nats, and it's a winner. Today's pick of the day, as we are now 41 and 52, we are going with Suarez of the Phillies against the Pirates. The Phillies, in my opinion, are behind the Braves. That's not an opinion, that's a fact. Slight bit of underperformance here to start the season going against a team that for the second year in a row has had a bit of overperformance, and that's the Pirates. You may recall what happened to the Pirates last year after their sizzling start. They ended up exactly where you would think they'd end up. Now, I want the Pirates to stay hot as I'm going to Pittsburgh next week, and I'd love them to be playing great, right as the live with nothing personal, nothing personal live with David Sampson show is happening. But, the Pirates are going to have a little bit of a stumble this evening. If you've watched, people are worried about Nola's velocity. For the Phillies to win, they need Nolan Wheeler at the top to beat two aces. Suarez is pretty underrated in their rotation. He shouldn't be. You should have watched in the last year in the playoffs, last year's in the playoffs. You're only minus 148. I'm going Phillies over Pirates as the nothing personal pick of the day. The Masters starts today. That's a big one. Everyone's excited. Everyone, this is when, golf's funny. Basketball, when people watch basketball, they marvel at what they can do. Wow, look at him dunk. I can't do that. When people watch baseball, they're hitting 100 miles an hour. I can't throw or hit 100 miles an hour. People, when they watch golf, they get on the golf course and they say, oh, if I just had the perfect swing, I still could get the hole in one. I could drive the green on a par five at Augusta. I could par the 18th at St. Andrews. It's such a fun sport when you can watch it and think that you can do it. Of course, you're being totally delusional, but don't worry. I'm here for your delusion. The Masters, to me, is an interesting tournament. I've not been to Augusta. What interests me is the way they run the tournament, the way they control the tournament. What interests me is the way they control who's a member of their club there in Augusta. They control who plays. They control who pays. Well, the irony of Tiger Woods winning in the Masters always makes me smile. I love it when a Jewish golfer would win the Masters. It makes me happy. Greg Norman is walking around Augusta right now. There's so much tension, not even about the weather. So much tension because the talk, sadly, is about live and PGA. There's about 13 live golfers out of the 89 field staff. It's a pretty big percentage. And they're coexisting. They're practicing together. They're on the range together. They're playing together. John Rahm, hey, I got a couple hundred million. What'd you get? Oh, um, nothing. I just got an investment from John Henry, who instead of signing Mookie Betts, decided to put money into our pockets. That was nice of him. I'm totally kidding. That wasn't John Henry's choice. It's not bets or investing in PGA. Steve Cohn was able to pay Verlander and, and Scherzer not to pitch for him and invest in the PGA. Believe me, you could do both. It's totally different. But what's going to happen between Live and PGA? Will progress ever be made? I'm here to tell you that during a tournament like this, the talk by the media is, hey, Live officials, PGA officials, they're all together. They're going to talk. They're going to make progress. You don't make progress when you have meetings that are in the middle of events. You have meetings. MLB used to do this all the time. They would meet with the union during the All-Star game. They'd have a bargaining session during the NBA playoffs. Everybody is so distracted. Nothing really gets done. 
The real work gets done in boardrooms that are in New York or in another city where you close the doors, roll up your sleeves, and figure out, is there a way that Live and PGA can go forward together? Is there a merger that can work that we announced almost a year ago? The fact that they're together and that people are watching to listen to what players say with John Rahm having quotes. Every player's having quotes basically saying, hey, you know, maybe we should be 72 holes, says Liv. Hey, maybe we should make nice with Liv, says PGA. Maybe it's bad for the game if we're not getting along. All of these are really nice quotes. I appreciate them, except they don't mean anything. What will mean something is if there is meaningful dialogue where Liv understands and PGA understands that it is only together that they can each survive, not apart. And until two parties both believe the same thing, you won't get a merger. You won't get an agreement. That's why in law school and with contracts, they call it something meeting of the minds. Meeting of the minds is that two people look at the same thing and they have the same conclusion about what it is that they're looking at. Whether it's a contract, whether it's the color of the sky, whether it is the plan or process moving forward, whatever the case is, a meeting of the minds is one of the most important legal doctrines that exists in contract law. It's what courts look to. Did two people think the same thing? And the number one most important thing that PGA and Liv do not have a meeting of the minds of as of yet is whether one of them can overtake the other and exist without the other. Because to date, they both think they can. And if that's the case, you're not going to have a meeting of the minds of the true point, which is that neither of them can exist without the other and that they both need each other and that is when an agreement will finally take place. I've got a, uh, I've got a wait to see about the Masters. There's a lot of talk about Tiger Woods. He's there trying to play, thinking he can make it. DraftKings has a line of minus 115. The Tiger does not make the cut. Wait to see when I tell you something's going to happen. Tiger Woods will not make the cut. I didn't understand back pain until I had it. Christian Yelich tried to explain it to me time and time again. Until I had it with some of the running I did, I didn't realize when Yelich asked me to pick up a bat and swing it when I had hurt my back running. And I realized that not only could I not pick up the bat, not because it was too heavy, I literally couldn't do it because it hurt my back just to lift it. And then swinging was out of the question. Tiger Woods had the accident, the horrible car accident. He's had tons of injuries. He's in constant pain. Walking Augusta with the pressure of trying to win one more green jacket at Tiger's age, not going to happen. That's one way to see. I'm going to back it up with a second way to see. I'm going to say plus 225 that a live player wins the Masters because I'm all for chaos and I'm all for progress. If a live player wins the Masters, it will force the PGA to sit in a room with these people, the people in the sovereign funds, the people over there, who we all say don't want to exist, that we don't want to acknowledge. The people who are getting themselves involved in all of our sports and all of our business. Hey, we don't see it. We don't talk about it. If a live player wins, the Masters, A, you're going to get plus 225, wait to see. But B, it's going to foment conversation. So it could be Dustin Johnson, it could be Brooks Kepka, it could be John Rahm. There's 13 of them. Wait to see. Tiger misses the Masters cut and a live player wins the tournament. And then talks happen because it's just business. They'll look at each other and say, Sorry about before. I didn't mean it. It's nothing personal.